Well, good afternoon. It is certainly a joy to be with you once again, to be able to worship our God as we have in song, and really now to take just a few minutes that we have together here on this Sunday evening and open up God's Word and see what is there for us. We've been over the last several Sunday evenings that we've been together kind of going at things a little bit differently than we have been on Sunday morning, and tonight we'll kind of follow that line a little bit as well. We had, I guess, a couple of weeks now, maybe a month ago now, uh, it, I'd have to really th- you know, think about it, but weeks, month, maybe a month, I guess. But uh, John and I had a question and answer that, uh, that we did together uh, several weeks ago. And we made mention that evening that the questions that we received leading up to that, I mean, they were good, really good questions. And we made mention that we're planned on doing that again in September, one we put on the calendar already. And so if you've got questions uh, that you would like to have uh, answered or thought about, we, uh, we'd appreciate you. Go ahead. You can send those to us uh, at any time. You don't have to wait uh, until we're just a week or two away. You can send those to John or I at any moment. But the questions we got were good. I mean, really good. And we got really a bunch of them. And, and there were too many of them that we wouldn't have been able to cover all of them just in the one sitting that we had. But the questions themselves were big. I mean, if you remember, I covered just two questions in the time that I have. And John covered just one in the time that he had. And he made mention to me afterwards he probably could have used even more time on the one question that he had. And we had in the midst of those questions a couple of them that were really big questions. And and so I've taken one of those, and I'm going to kind of spend some time using an idea off of that question to kind of get us some things to think about, specifically on a topic on what the Bible has to say it, instead of living in speculation land like we often like to do, especially on this topic. And so one of the questions specifically was centering around angels. And not necessarily all of just what they were or how often they're mentioned or what their roles were or when they popped up in Scripture, but not just just wondering what the Bible has to say about angels, but also do they have a role? Do they have a role today, even in the life that we live? And so when you start to think about a question like that, it is a big question. And I'm going to give you an idea right off the bat. I'm not going to answer all of that question tonight. Because what I'd like to do in the few minutes that we have together, we're going to set some baseline about what the Bible has to say about angels, what they are, what they're all about, so we can end some of the speculation to get our minds kind of in the right place to what the Bible has to say. And then another moment in the future, probably on a Sunday evening at some point moving on down the weeks, we'll tackle the back half of that question and see. And maybe we'll look into the page of the New Testament to see the roles angels played specifically there and if the Bible has anything to say about their role for us today. But for us tonight, we're going to just take a look at what the Bible has to teach us about angels. And why I think this is an important question is really twofold. And the first is the media dominates our minds when it comes to what angels are all about. I mean TV, movies, pictures, songs, books. I mean, it is a character that we find religiously that has really, in a lot of ways, mentally been given us a very specific kind of stereotype about what an angel is all about. And I think so much so, it can invade or certainly taint what even the Bible has to say what angels are all about. I'll give you kind of an example of that. Because I don't think it's the number one kind of character biblically that the media does that to us. I'll say the number one character of that is the devil, right? 
the media depicts the devil in a very specific way. It is the red suit. It is the horns. It is the spiked tail. It is the pitchfork. It is that idea. And when we just put that picture in our mind, it's dangerous to do that because if that guy came walking at me, I'm going to see him. I'm going to notice him. I'm going to see the red, horned, on fire, pitchfork guy walking my way. There is no way I'm ever going to miss that. And we paint our, we see that so much. The danger is that becomes, well, certainly that must have came from God's word because that's what everybody thinks the devil is about and what he looks like. And when we come to find out, It isn't what the Bible has to say about what he looks like at all. And I'll say right behind that is the angel. The white garment, the halo, the flowing hair, the blue eyes, the very young, the wings, the aura about them just kind of floating around, doing good to the people around them. Maybe from time to time one will pop up on your shoulder opposite the red guy popping up on your older shoulder and they'll have an an interesting argument. I mean, right, that is the picture that we have often. But what I want us to understand is when when it comes to these kinds of things, speculation oftentimes is a very dangerous land to live in. Because what I want us to see, especially in the few minutes that we have tonight, the Bible is not silent concerning angels and what they're like and, and, and what they do and how they do it. It actually talks about them a lot. And so we don't have to live in speculation land. We don't have to do the what ifs or the maybes. We know a lot more about angels biblically that God tells us, reveals to us, than I think often we think that that is the case. And so we're going to tackle some of that for a few minutes tonight, and hopefully this will be useful information to you. And maybe these are some things that you've not thought about before, and it will be helpful to you as we kind of tackle this subject of angels. And so we'll start really with the word itself. The Hebrew, when you find this word angel used specifically in the Old Testament, the Hebrew, it is the Hebrew word malik, and it means very simply messenger. And you're going to see a very common thread with that more here in just a moment. It just means messenger, and it's found 103 times. That Hebrew word is found 103 times in our Bibles, that Hebrew word malik. And about half of those is spiritual beings, and the other half are just human messengers. Two examples. The first is 1 Kings chapter 19. I hope you have a Bible handy with you tonight. We're going to be looking at a lot of passages. I'll try to go as slow as I can. But in the, just in a couple examples of that. 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 2. Uh, Elijah is running away uh, from uh, Jezebel, he's had a, an incredible uh, victory uh, for God uh, on Mount Carmel. And, and now Ahab and Jezebel, verse 1, and all that Elijah had done, and also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. And then verse 2, then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah. That is that Hebrew word malik. Now translated here, the New King James Messenger. It's, it's a, a messenger to Elijah, and it had specifically a message. And so what we see here, that's just a human messenger, that Hebrew word. But the same Hebrew word is also found in Genesis chapter 28, talking now about something very different. Genesis chapter 28 now in verse 12, specific, can't get the word out, specifically is what I'm looking for. Verse 12, Genesis chapter 28. Then he dreamed, this is Jacob, and he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Again, that same exact Hebrew word, Malik, but here, not talking about a Hebrew messenger that's sent out, but now spiritual messengers. And so you have in the Hebrew 
an either-or scenario. So you're going to have to look at the context. You're going to have to look at kind of the surrounding verses. And at times, the translator will help you as it did here with messenger and angels. And now to the Greek and the New Testament. In the Greek for the New Testament, angelos is there. Again, what does it mean? Messenger. It is defined exactly the same. And it is found a bunch of times. 175 times in the New Testament, and very rarely, just six times that that Greek word is used to describe men fulfilling that role. Usually, if a man was going to be fulfilling the role of a messenger, a different Greek word is going to be used. Six times it's used, but predominantly, you're going to have this word used about the spiritual messengers that are used. And so I want you just to kind of think about these things. There are lots of other terms that I think can also be applied to angels at times. Sons of God is used to reference these kind of messengers in the chapter 1 of the book of Job. In the book of Daniel, you have different words like watcher or watchers. You're going to get hosts that are used. Archangel is used. We'll talk about that more here in just a moment. Principalities, powers, and dominions are often used to describe these beings. And, but oftentimes they're often even distinguished between angels. You'll get that and word like in Romans chapter 8, 1 Peter chapter 3, where you'll have angels and principalities and powers made mention of. And so you have all of these terms given to us. And so I want to f- spend a few minutes in talking about kind of descriptors. What about their nature? Biblically, do we learn anything specifically about them? Or is the right picture that we started with of the, the baby face, flowing hair, robed, winged, haloed, aura-filled child is exactly the picture that biblically we have of an angel? I'm going to give you a little bit of a hint, no. That's just, that's, I guess that's a big hint. That isn't, that isn't a picture that you find anywhere in Scripture. But there are some things that we can learn. I want to give you a couple of things to think about. And the first is this. They are spirit beings. They are spiritual beings. A couple of passages that kind of help us with this. In the book of Hebrews, the pages of the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, if you want to turn over there. Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14, they are not, are, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister, talking about angels in the context, sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. And so you have that point being made, they are spiritual beings. And so that tells us they themselves don't have physical Bodies. Now, they're manifested in physical bodies from time to time, but they are spiritual beings. But what also is interesting, at the same time that they are spiritual beings, the Bible also wants us to understand that they are created beings. And, and so sometimes that's difficult for us to grab hold of sometimes, right? We are physical beings, and so I think it's easy for us to realize that we are physical beings and we are created beings. Those things go together very easily. But you have something like this. Their angels are spiritual beings, but yet the Bible also teaches us that they are created beings. How do we know that? Psalm 148, Psalm 148, beginning in verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you stars of light. Praise him, you heavens of heavens, and you, uh, and you waters above the heavens. Verse 5, let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. And so in a list of things like the heavens, and a list of things like the sun and the moon, you have here angels, and so they are spiritual beings, but yet created. How many are there? Well, that also is a good question, and I'll give you the answer to that. In Revelation chapter 5, when John is being shown the revelation that he shows and then shares with us, in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 11, he says, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, 
the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands. Now, I, I don't think that's a math equation that John has given us there to do the math of 10 times 10 times thousands times thousands. The point is making here is they are innumerable, uncountable. They are so many, they are uncountable. And so you have these created spiritual beings that are innumerable, but the Bible also wants us to understand that they are a higher order than man. What does that mean? Well, I want, to think, want you to think about a couple of things with me. One passage in the book of Hebrews, and then two passages in the book of Matthew. We're going to start with this idea directly stated in Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 6, But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man, that you are mindful of him, or the son of man, that you take care of him? You made him a little lower than the angels, and crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. And so you have this idea of man being created under the angels. And so what does that mean? Well, I want you to think of two things that that means. The one is given to us in Matthew chapter 24, and the other is given to us in Matthew chapter 28. So the first Matthew chapter 24 in verse 36. Now we know that they have wisdom, and they have knowledge that man doesn't have. Why? Because it comes from God, right? God says, here is a message I want you to deliver. And now they have knowledge that at times man doesn't have. But just because they have higher knowledge than man does not necessarily mean they have all knowledge. That's God. Only God has all knowledge. Only God, only deity has all knowledge. Angels do not in any way fall into that category. They do not have all knowledge like God does. How do we know that? Well, look at what is said in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36. It says, but of that day, this is Jesus speaking, of that day and that hour, no one knows. And then he adds, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And so the point he's making here is that there is knowledge that the angels have is high, but it is limited. They are not deity. They do not have full wisdom, and they also do not have all power. Again, God, he is the only with all power. Matthew chapter 28, Matthew chapter 28, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. Power that man does not have, but limited power. And so I want you to understand the picture that we have given to us in a lot of ways here. The picture that we have is, is of spiritual beings, of created beings, innumerable as they are, Higher than man, but limited when it comes to things of God. And so I want you to understand, biblically speaking, angels specifically always appeared as men, biblically. Never as women, or certainly never as children. I'll tell you, you may be surprised, but when they show up in Scripture, they always have clothes on. Always do. Never will you find them without clothes. And one interesting thing... We think about what it is that they look like. Well, you know, that's an interesting thing. Again, the book of Hebrews helps us with that. Hebrews chapter 13. We're just thinking about, well, what is it do they look like? Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2. Hebrews chapter 13 is where I am. Do not forget to entertain strangers for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. So what does that tell us? It can tell us that they can at times be so disguised, they're not identified as angels at all. 
And so I want us to understand that this is what the Bible says about angels. And sometimes that is in battle with what our mind thinks an angel is all about. Sometimes we paint that picture that we've talked about of the wings and the robes and the halos and all of those things. And when we think about it in that way, we'll talk about this more here in just a, in just a moment. But we think about, there are, aren't there uh, spiritual heavenly beings that are made mention of having wings, right? At, at times, even lots of wings in the book of Revelation. Yes, there are heavenly beings with wings, lots of wings. Heavenly beings with heads in different animal shapes, as John will make mention of. But when we know specifically an angel, messenger of God is being mentioned. I want you to think about what we learned there in Hebrews chapter 13. So it's one other thing I want to get into, and we're going to kind of draw these things together a little bit. We think about even classifications of angels. Really interesting kind of reading when it comes to that. One thing we've made mention of already, the archangel. This archangel, what's that all about? What's well, an interesting kind of conversation, one that's brought up specifically with a name given to us, Michael, who shows up a, a few times in Scripture. One such time is in Jude, verse 9. Jude, verse 9, gives us his name and this classification. It says that Michael, Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed against the body of Moses, dared not bring it against him, a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. And so here you have Michael, the archangel, contending with the devil over the body of Moses. Now, two weeks from now, John will talk directly about Jude 9, about what it's all about, what Michael and the devil were arguing about, what wrestling moves they were using over Moses' body. You know, oftentimes the, I get people asking, what, what was that all about right there? I'm like, I don't know what that was. I wasn't there. I, I, I wasn't there. I don't know what that was all about. But what do we have here? This classification kind of helping us out. It is Michael the archangel. In Daniel chapter 12, it pops up several times in the book of Daniel. We have a really another kind of classification or designation given to him in Daniel chapter 12. At that time, Michael, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And so you have again here him making, being made mention of as the great prince. He pops up again towards the end of our Bibles, Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7, that a war broke out into heaven. And Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. And so you have this idea of Michael uh, being mentioned to us there. The chief prince is already made mention. We've used the book of Daniel already at times. Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the king of Persia. And so now you have, again, this classification of a chief prince. In the reading that I did over the last couple of weeks, there's a lot of people that will include Gabriel in that uh, group as well. He's not ever mentioned specifically like this with the designation of chief prince, but Gabriel is mentioned by name multiple times. He explains to Daniel visions in Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 9. He's the one that talks to Zacharias and Mary, uh, the birth, uh, preluding the birth of John the Baptist in Luke chapter 1. And so he does pop up from time to time. And so possibly he can be kind of in this category. We often are brought up to things like the cherubim and the seraphim. I think that's an interesting conversation, one that I'm going to talk more about when we have opportunity into the future to talk about their roles today and their roles to come. Cherubim and seraphim are made mention of at length. 
They are made mention of with wings. They are made mention of of those incredible things in the book of Revelation and in other places. And and it's quite possible that those are angels. I I lean a little bit to just heavenly beings, uh, a a different order of just heavenly beings, not angels themselves, uh, because we constantly think messenger when it comes to an angel. And, And so I want you to think of two things as we kind of start bringing our thoughts to a close. And the first is, not only on this topic, but on lots of different topics, here is good a good order of advice. It's hard today because there are so many outside of the Bible telling us what we need to be thinking about. And so I would caution us to not just on this topic, but on every topic, but for us specifically on this topic tonight, to focus on what the Bible actually reveals. To focus on what the Bible actually reveals. Avoid in every way vain speculation. And I'll tell you to avoid vain speculation because not just is it not helpful, it's condemned. So avoid that vain speculation. And just be okay with focusing on what the Bible actually reveals. Why do I say just be okay? Well, we are by nature, I think, man, curious people. Do I want to know more of what was happening there in Jude verse 9 about, you know, the wrestling over the body of Moses? Kind of behind the curtain kind of scenario, sure. But I'm not given anymore. I'm given what we were given. And we can try to build into our mind what more was going into that, but God doesn't give us any more. And so as we talked about this morning, specifically about God's word, and not just taking God's word to just read it. I read God's word, that's what the preacher tells me to do, I'm going to read it, so now I'm going to be okay. That's not what we have God's word for. It's not just to read, it is to immerse ourselves in. It is to envelop ourselves with God's word. Right? That's what we talked about this morning. So it, it, it's so much ingrained in who I am that without even thinking, what, what spills over is the will of God. That's what comes out. And, and that has to be what our focus is. My focus is on what God has told me, what he has revealed. If he hasn't revealed a piece, even a piece I want to know badly, if he hasn't revealed that, and he hasn't revealed that for a reason. And that reason probably is too much for me to understand anyways. We've got to be okay with that. And to understand with what God has revealed in his word is everything I need. There isn't anything missing from God's word that I need. There's nothing missing. He has revealed everything that I need. And if you think about God's word in that way, I think that'll help avoid just kind of outlandish speculation about things. And so when we think about angels specifically, I think there's a great temptation to to be thinking about angels in that speculative kind of way. And media doesn't help. Media doesn't help. How many movies have there been specifically about an angel or TV shows even about an angel and what they do? books written about what angels are all about, and we read those things, and we forget what genre those things are in, fiction, fiction, and we've got to be reminded of that, but when we open up God's word, we can learn about what angels are all about, and so hopefully some of this helps, it it kind of is a base for or we can spring off of. It's a little deeper conversation, I think, when we get into what angels are all about in the pages of the New Testament today in that discussion. And I think this will help us for that next discussion that is to come. You know, it's an interesting opportunity that we have on a Sunday night like this to just kind of think about a topic and ask the question, in a lot of ways, what does the Bible say about it? I'll tell you, from my preparation That's exactly what I did. Angels, what does the Bible say about it? That's in a lot of ways how I approached my study for this week, and I shared those things that I found. 
And so hopefully some of this was helpful to you. Maybe there's another question that spurned off of it. Well, I'd encourage you to, to send it. Send it our way. We'll take a look at it. Maybe it'll uh, be something that we'll cover even outside of those very specific question and answer things as we are apt to be doing here and at other times as well. We appreciate your kind attention tonight. Mark has chosen an invitation song for us, and, and it is. It gives us an opportunity as we are all here, we are gathered together, we are thinking about God, we are focusing on Him, we are praising Him in song as we've done. We've talked to Him in prayer. He is our focus this day in every way. And so it is certainly proper. It is proper for us to be thinking about it as we sing this song of encouragement, to be thinking about our relationship with God. And just like this day and every day, if we find in our own hearts that our relationship with God is not right, it needs to be taken care of and it needs to be taken care of immediately. And we have an opportunity for that as we sit. We have an opportunity for that right here. We are in an immediate opportunity. And maybe you're looking at your heart and you know that it isn't where God needs it to be. Well, let's do something about that. And just maybe we can help you in some way. If we can, you let us know as we stay in the sing. Oh,